to share a couple of words that have been very much on my heart since, pretty much since we got here. Uh, and I know that I share these words in sympathy or in sync with my wife, Ina, and my son, Nathan. They totally agree with this. And that is simply to say, we love you guys. <laughs> you guys are awesome. <laughs> we, we have felt so welcomed here and loved, uh, we've been very well fed. <laughs> Little too much, maybe. Uh, you've, you've put us up, you've, you've worshiped with us, you've prayed with us, you've shared your life with us, and we just love that. Love that, you guys are really on the right track, and I just feel like God has a special, he's doing something special here in this town and in this region. Uh, the second thing I want to say, too, is that, and this very much comes from my heart, as we've been sitting alongside you in Mass, hearing some of your stories, some of you have really gone through it, haven't you? Tremendous suffering. The kind of suffering that would crush any man without faith. But you've weathered through, and you've stood tall, and you have a testimony to the goodness of God through it. It's just mind-blowing. I just want to say that the kind of faith that we've experienced here among you is so encouraging. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So be, be encouraged, because God is very much moving among this community, and your open heart towards us is testimony to that. Before I begin my talk, I did want to pray something. As I was thinking about my talk this morning, I did want to pray before I begin uh, a special prayer, not only over you all, but over the nation. Because I know that uh, what God is doing here in this community is protecting you from the darkness that is coming upon not only your nation, but the world. We experience it too in the United States. Maybe not as intense, but it is there and it's growing. And so I just feel like God wants to say that whatever is going on here in this family, this loving, welcoming family, is a light for the rest of the nation. So let me just pray. I, I, I'm gonna ask that if you are able to, if you could get on your knees, And we're praying to the one who's right here in the room with us, which is wonderful. Yesterday was the Feast of the Sacred Heart, and one of the promises of Jesus to St. Mary Ellen Copa is that his Sacred Heart is an ocean of infinite mercy, and that from that mercy, he will make the tepid souls fervent and the fervent souls perfect. And so I want to pray that over this community and over the nation, just for a minute. The sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. The sacred heart of Jesus, pour out your love upon us. O sacred heart of Jesus, spread your light in this nation. We know the days are dark and evil. They were in your time. They are also in ours. And so we ask you, Lord, just as you raised up 12 men to spread your light and truth, and to win an empire for Christ. Do the same here in Trinidad. You are raising up amazing faith warriors right here 
in this building, you've got a number of them. And so I just ask you, Lord Jesus, from your sacred heart, that infinite ocean of mercy, that you would raise up the temple to become fervent, that you would raise up the fervent to become perfect, and that this family here would be a light to the nation and to the world. In your holy name we pray. It was a midsummer's day, the sun at its peak in the sky. Heat waves shimmered in the distance, the air thick with humidity. On a barren hill, a kilometer's walk from the town of Sikar, stood a well. At the well, despite the heat, sat a man, alone. He was waiting, waiting to meet someone. Soon a woman appeared carrying a pole on her shoulders. Attached to either end were two empty jars. She was there to draw water. He was there to draw her to himself. I speak, of course, of the Samaritan woman at the well which we read about in John chapter four. In church tradition, the woman at the well is named Saint Fotina. I didn't know that until I looked it up. After her meeting with Christ, Fotina lived a celibate life, did penance for her sins, and died a martyr. During Nero's persecution, the same persecution that would put to death Saints Peter and Paul, Saint Fotina traveled to Rome in order to convert the emperor. This is one wild and crazy woman. She didn't convert him, unfortunately, but she did manage to bring Nero's daughter and over a hundred of Nero's slaves to Christ before she was captured, imprisoned, tortured, and thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. St. Fotina's journey toward martyrdom began 30 years prior on that summer's day at the well. John the Evangelist crafts the story with absolutely brilliant choreography. Jesus and the woman engage in a kind of dance around the well. For him, it is the dance of the bridegroom in pursuit of his bride. For her, it is a dance that expresses a range of emotion, from shame to inexpressible joy. If we look carefully at this interchange between Jesus and Fotina, the woman at the well, we can learn three things, three insights, that will help us further deepen our spiritual lives. First, and this may be the most important point of the story, the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4 is really the story of God coming after us. It is the story of God's relentless pursuit of those who are lost, those who have been held captive by the wounds and pains of life, especially those who have made grave mistakes and are choking on their own shame and who because of that shame are unwilling to go after God. God instead goes after them. It's been said by modern scholars that the Bible is primarily a book about man's search for God. If true, that would make it a very uninteresting book. No, the Bible is in fact about God's search for us. 
that's something far more interesting. From God's cry in Genesis, Adam, where are you? To the final words of Revelation, behold, I am coming soon. The Bible is about a God who relentlessly pursues us, not to punish, but to forgive, to heal, to bring us into his fellowship and love. We see this clearly in the encounter between Jesus and the woman at the well. When Jesus wanted to travel to Judea, which is in the south of Israel, I'm uh, sorry, from Judea in the south of Israel to Galilee in the north, he didn't take the usual route that skirts around the region of Samaria. You see, Jews considered the people of Samaria to be unclean. Thus, they avoided contact with Samaritans at all costs. Samaritans were considered by Jews to be half-breeds, the progeny of those who, during the conquest of the Holy Land, despite God's orders, intermarried with the Canaanite tribes, adopting their ways, worshiping their gods. To the Jews, the Samaritans were an outcast people, outcast from the temple in Jerusalem, outcast from the trade with Israel and goods and services that they provided. Jesus ignored all that. He made his way, even at the risk of scandalizing his own disciples, straight for Samaria. More than that, he went straight for her, for Fotina. There were dozens of cities in Samaria. He chose Sikar. There were several thousand people living in Sikar. He chose Fotina. He's a Jew going after a Samaritan. He's a man going after a woman. He is perfect God going after someone all too imperfect. It's important to note that the meeting took place at noon, in the heat of the day. Why was Fotina coming to the well alone? Why not in the cooler morning hours when everyone else in town had to make the daily trek for water? What was wrong with her? We find out. No one wants to be seen with Fotina because she was known in the town of Sikar to be a grave sinner. So here is the sinless Messiah going after what may well have been the most infamous sinner in Sikar. Jesus had an appointment with Fotina set before the beginning of time. This is the first principle we learn from the woman at the well. God relentlessly pursues us even when, especially when, we feel furthest from him. As John choreographs the encounter, we learn a second principle, that Jesus went after Fotina, despite how it may have looked to his disciples. And John tells us that the disciples were amazed to see Jesus talking with, sitting with a woman. No, Jesus went after the woman at the well because he wanted to set her free. He wanted to set her free. Fotina's woundedness had led her to make some very bad choices in life. She was buried in shame. Too ashamed to be seen with others. Too ashamed to get right with God. Now, shame is a very interesting state of the soul. And it is one I need to confess, it is one with which I am very familiar. You see, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who blame, and there are those who have shame. <laughs> I put myself in that latter group. This, by the way, is why my wife and I never have arguments. She's in that first group. <laughs> so she thinks everything that's bad is my fault. And I think that everything, everything that's bad is also my fault. <laughs> so we never argue. And by the way, we both have progressed quite a bit beyond that. Thanks to the Eucharist and thanks to Catholic devotions, uh, we've been healed of a lot of the blaming and the shaming. 
I've long struggled with shame, and I'm not entirely sure why. And I, I guess that there are probably others in this room that are similar to, to me in this. I often say that there's a kind of black hole in my life, a, a decade of my childhood about which I remember very little. What memories I do have are not good ones. This black hole caused me to struggle with shame for many years. This shame in turn led to several crippling problems in my life, and I'm sure many of you can relate to some of this. Anxiety, sort of low-level undercurrent that just things aren't right. We're not sure why, not sure what to do about it. Panic attacks, an eating disorder, social phobias, and I know I'm not alone in this because studies show that some 30%, at least of Americans, struggle with anxiety disorders of some sort or other, and I'm sure the number is probably higher than that. I'm here to tell you today that there is a wonderful life beyond all those things. That there is healing for shame, healing for panic, anxiety, phobias, and in fact, the source of that healing is found right here in John chapter 4, in the story of the woman at the well. More on that in just a moment. It's essential to keep in mind that shame is not a state of character. It is a feeling, nothing more. St. Thomas Aquinas calls shame a passion. That is something that we experience temporarily as a kind of internal suffering, but which has no bearing upon who we truly are. In fact, shame can be a good thing. When we feel shame about a past act, we are less likely to commit that act in the future. A healthy sense of shame, and I underline healthy here, a healthy sense of shame is essential to the virtuous life. It is rather the shameless those without a well-developed conscience who get into so much trouble. There's a second reason why shame is not such a bad thing. Here I'm going to get a little controversial, but bear with me, please. Sometimes God allows us to get sick. Sometimes God allows us to fail at something, something we were really hoping we would succeed at. Sometimes, I emphasize sometimes, he even allows Satan to whisper words in our ears so sweet we can't help but be tempted by them. Shame can overwhelm us when these things happen. But that's exactly what God is after. He knows, God knows, that our pride is so strong our egoism, our narcissism, so much woven into our character, our hearts so hardened to any crime but our own little pity parties, that the only way to get through to us, the only way to get us to see ourselves truly, is for us to fall, and sometimes to fall hard. The shame that results is our wake-up call. St. Peter had to experience the shame of denying Christ three times before he was ready to leave the church. Lord, you know that I love you. Peter had to experience the depths of his own shame before he could utter that cry. St. Paul wrestles with his own shame in Romans chapter 7. I know the things that I should do, he writes. But these are the very things I find myself doing. And I know the things that I should do, but I can't bring myself to do them. Oh, wretched man that I am, he says. But in that self-knowledge, Paul found a deeper reliance on Christ. There is now no condemnation, he says, in the very next chapter, the very beginning of the next chapter. 
There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. First verse of Romans chapter 8. That place of deep self-awareness. Oh, wretched man that I am. The knowledge of what monsters we can be when we're apart from God's grace. That is where God wants all of us, you and me included. Some of us are so stubborn. <laughs> Some of us are such slow learners. And I'm looking at my wife, and I have it right here in my notes. My wife knows exactly what I'm talking about, because this is my thing. Some of us are so stubborn, such slow learners, that God can't get through to us in any other way than through our own failings. St. John Henry, Henry Newman, one of my favorite saints, in fact, he was the one who led me into the Catholic Church, his writings, I should say. St. John Henry Newman has a beautiful statement that describes this very thing, that it is our failures that bring us to the truth, not our successes. And he writes, and I quote, we advance to the truth by experience of error. We know not how to do right, except by having done wrong. We call virtue a mean between two extremes. That is to say, virtues lie between things that are wrong. We do not see the truth at once and make towards it, but we fall upon and we try error and find it is not the truth. Such is the process by which we succeed. We walk to heaven backwards. And I love that phrase. If you remember nothing else from this talk, you remember that phrase, we walk to heaven backwards. It is part of our fallen human nature that we think of ourselves as grander and more sublime than we actually are. We make idols of our self-ascribed self -ascribed dignity, of our progress in virtue and holiness. And so God removes those props. He lets us fall so that he can show us the truth of who we really are. This, of course, is a great act of God's mercy. For only in letting us fall can he catch us at the bottom of ourselves and fill us with ever greater measures of his grace. This is exactly what Christ is doing with the woman at the well. He wants her to see the true roots of her shame and how with his help she can see her great moral failure as the necessary occasion, the necessary occasion for him to enter into her life. Jesus reveals this to her like a skilled surgeon. He slices away the layers of her shame, exposing the wounds that are at its source so that she can see the true beauty of who she was created to be, a bride of an evangelist for the King of Kings. The Apostle John, however, doesn't tell us exactly how Jesus did this. We hear Jesus confront the woman about living with a man out of wedlock, even though she's been married five times. And then suddenly, she's dropping her water jars and running off into Sikar to tell the townspeople about, and I quote, the man who told me everything I ever did, end quote. We don't have a transcript of what transpired between those two things. Jesus calling out her sin, and the woman's running into town to tell her neighbors about the Messiah. But we do have a brilliant and very moving speculative account of what might have happened. Have you all seen, maybe some of you haven't, have you seen the, the series The Chosen? Do they show that on the TV here? You can watch it for free on YouTube, at least most of the chapters. It's a very popular multi-season show about the life of Jesus and his disciples. 
And while it does take some liberties with the biblical text, I think it stays pretty true to what the church teaches about Christ. The scene in the chosen of the woman at the well is, in my opinion, one of the best scenes in the whole series. And again, you can watch that just that scene on YouTube. Type in the chosen woman at the well, you'll find it. If you can watch the scene without crying, if I can read the scene without crying, we need to check to see if we have a pulse. Here's how the chosen lays out what happened between the woman being called out for her sin and her throwing down her water jars and running in the sea car. Jesus and the woman have been going back and forth about proper worship. He tells her plainly that he is the Messiah. And we learn that this is the very first time that he makes that announcement in public. He's doing it to St. Protina. She scoffs in disbelief and is about to leave the well and head back into town. Then Jesus starts speaking to her in hushed tones. The first one was named Rami, he says. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married, but he wasn't a good man. He hurt you, and it made you question marriage, even the practice of your faith. Stop it, complains Fatima. But Jesus continues. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel ashamed for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy of him. The woman begins to weep now. Why are you doing this? She complains through her tears. I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah, said Jesus. You are the first. It would be good if you believe me. You picked the wrong person, she cries out. Then Jesus cuts to the heart. I came to Samaria just to meet you. Now sobbing, the woman says, but I'm rejected by others. I know, says Jesus, but not by me. As Jesus says this, you can see a change that takes place on the woman's face. From dark and struggling with shame, she becomes lighter, joy beginning to twinkle in her eyes, like a flower unfolding to meet the morning sun. You know this about me, she asks, because you are the Christ? Jesus nods yes. I'm going to tell everyone, she exclaims with joy. I was counting on it, says Jesus. So what exactly happened in that transformation? How was it that a woman, only aware of her shame and unworthiness, known in town as someone to be avoided, as someone unclean, suddenly runs back into that same town, wanting to tell everybody about Christ. How is it that someone so broken becomes a joyful preacher of the good news? This brings me to my third and final point. It is to ask the question, how can a gravely sinful woman crippled by shame, shunned by the whole town, turn around and in her joy win that same town for Christ? Jesus answers that question. Drink the water from this well and you will thirst again, he says. But drink the water that I give and you will never thirst again. The water that I give is living water, and it will well up with you, within you, as a source of eternal life. That living water is, of course, the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that peels back the layers of our shame, uncovers our woundedness, just as Jesus did with St. Plotina then softens our hearts 
to receive the good news. The good news that God is after us, that he is waiting to meet with us, not to condemn us, but to heal our shame, to break the bonds of our anxieties and phobias, and then to send us out on a mission to preach Christ to those who are still bound by these things. In telling the woman that he was the long-awaited Messiah, that he had come specifically for her, not to judge, but to heal, Jesus was in those acts pouring living water, the, the Holy Spirit, into her soul. This is why she threw down her water jars. The two jars were symbols of her woundedness on the one hand and of her shame on the other. Symbols of every effort she made in her own strength to cope with her shame. She threw down her jars of dead water and instead drank deeply of the living water of Christ. This water became in her a kind of light, lighting up the truth of who she really is, burning away her sense of unworthiness and placing in the forefront of her mind the man who would restore her dignity after a lifetime of sins and bring her, even through martyrdom, to a saint's reward in heaven. This same living water, as you all know, is available to you and me. You see, there is a sense in which we all live in Samaria. The pious skirt around us for fear of becoming unclean. There are times when we all go to the well in the heat of the day because we are the outcasts. That's precisely where Jesus meets us. He comes to our well, to the depths of our fallenness, in the heat of the day, just for us, longing to pour living water into our hearts. If you had known who I was, Jesus says to the woman at the well, you would have asked me, and I would have given you living water. We know who he is, but are we asking? Are we asking for living water? Let's talk about that act of asking for living water for just a moment. What does that look like? How do we do it? I want to close my talk today by giving you the most practical advice that I can think of. I want to share with you a prayer that I learned. If you need more of the living water in your life, this is the prayer to pray. I learned this prayer from a Dominican friar, Father Gargu Lagrange, professor of spiritual theology at the Angelica in Rome for 50 years. Father died in 1964, but not before leading the world his magnificent two-volume work, The Three Ages of the Internal Life. It is in the first volume of the Three Ages that you will hear Father Eric de Lagrange describe the one prayer that God always hears. He writes, and I quote, when Christ tells us to seek first God's kingdom, what he's really telling us is that if we ask the Father for greater knowledge of him, and if we ask the Son for greater love for him, we shall be heard. Let me repeat that. When Christ tells us to seek first God's kingdom, what he's really telling us is that if we ask the Father for greater knowledge of him, and if we ask the Son for greater love for him, we shall be heard. That's it. That's the twofold prayer for living water. Father God, I'm trapped within the knowledge of my own sin, brokenness, unworthiness. Help me get beyond all that to know you as you truly are and to see myself as you see me. Lord Jesus, reading and directly.
for Jesus. I am so weighed down by my shame. I can't bring myself to the picture, let alone love him. Help me, despite my shame, to see you and seeing you to love you. Help me to dull the pain of my unworthiness enough so that I might experience and come to trust your love for me. In truth, this twofold prayer for a greater knowledge of the Father and a greater love for Christ is a way of asking God for living water. God, I need your Holy Spirit, your living water, to know you more deeply, to love you more fervently. This is the prayer that God always hears. May God, in response to these two petitions, pour into our hearts his living water, the Holy Spirit. May that water well up within us as a source of our healing, leading us, even through martyrdom, to life forever in him and with him. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.